uh, that section there. We're going to be uh, reading out of Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. You can either use your little bulletin or if you want to use uh, your Bible, if you brought your own Bible or if there are Bibles on the table, you can use that. It's up to you. Uh, but let's all stand at this point in time in honor of uh, the reading of the God. I'm going to begin the reading in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And his countenance was like lightning. And his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, he burst the shade, and he came to the And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, and he said, Come, see the place where the Lord is Thank you. Please be seated. So my question for you today, as my title implies, is, are all religions the same? You know, the multiculturalists and the pluralists of our day would like us to believe that this is true, that all religions are the same at their core, at their essence, there is no difference between them. Just pick one, whatever you're born into, that's fine. If you change your religion, that's fine. If you don't have a religion, that's fine. But upon honest interrogation of the facts, I believe it is undeniable that this is simply not the case. Any true student of religion, if you've studied the different, say, let's take the various major religions of the world, and you put them side by side and look at what they believe, what they teach, they teach very different things. Now, it is simply untrue that all religions are the same, even if you try to boil them down to their end goals, which you could say, what's the purpose of religion? Well, it's to get you to heaven. You know, I believe it was Karl Marx, or, or somebody who believed in Karl Marx's writings, who said that religion was simply the opiate of the masses. It was a tool used by powerful people to control those that were weak. Uh, or you can say that the goal of religion is simply for morals, and that that's, again, what the powerful would do. They would use the morality of religion to control people, and that's all, all it's about. Now, if you can accept the fact that not all religions are the same, it brings up an important question. Which religion, then, is the best? And... Uh, now, we might recoil at this thought, right? That's, that's kind of a tough thing to think. Do, do we really want to talk about religion in that sense, that there could be a best religion? Because if there is a best religion, what if my religion is not the best religion, right? What should I do? And uh, we might recoil at this thought at first, and probably because of the influence of multiculturalism and pluralism. Uh, but this is a very valid question, and it is, of course, a... Uh, with an understanding that religions are practiced by fallible human beings. So we understand that uh, you could say that this is the best religion, but maybe it's not practiced in the best way, right? Because humans are fallible, so they mess everything up. However, like any product or idea, every religion has its fruits. Every religion has its fruits. People live their lives based on what they believe, and they believe, based on their religion, from their religion then, we get what's called culture. Out of culture flows politics and uh, all of these different things. So religion is very important because what man believes is ultimately kind of the source, if you think about it, of what man does. How man behaves. He behaves like how he believes. And he believes based on his religion, right? Uh, so which religion has borne the best fruits. Which religion has done the most good for people in this world? And I would also argue next. <laughs> Which religion? And of course, I'm going to make the case for Christianity, being a Christian, being a pastor. If I didn't, right, you guys would need to wonder what's up with this guy. But what makes Christianity so special? 
what is, what is it about Christianity that makes it unique, that makes it different than every other religion in the world? And why is it that we can look at Christianity and pick it out amongst a sea of religions and say, wow, there's just something about that Christian religion that's different than every other religion. And the word that I believe best uh, summarizes the, the thing that makes Christianity special is the word miracles. Christianity is filled with miracles. You may think so. Aren't other religions filled with miracles? Well, I don't know. Think about it. What other religions require you to believe in a miracle to be called a follower of that religion? Uh, Muhammad, did he perform any miracles? No. Though some may argue that his trip to Jerusalem was miraculous, but he didn't perform miracles. What about Buddha? Did Buddha perform miracles? Well, there are things in his life that people say were miraculous, but even to this day I've seen that there are, um, what are they called, uh, monks that will say, oh, well, those were just stories. So that, you don't have to believe that is the point. Uh, take other religions. There's plenty of other, other religions where, though there are miraculous or mythological things that are said, you don't have to accept them as being miracles per se. You can simply accept them as stories or mythos or a way of relating to the world or a way of relating to things in scripture. Like Christianity, you have to believe that somebody died, was buried, stayed dead for three days and three nights, and after that, rose from the dead. And he's alive today, and he's in heaven, and he's coming back for us. No other religion in the world has anything even close to that, anything even remotely like that. The amount of faith that's required to believe in something that we all know from our own personal experience is impossible. It would take, and it does take, and it is, a miracle. A miracle. So, what is the greatest miracle by far? Of course, besides you can consider very creation as the greatest miracle of all time, I believe it is. The greatest miracle that has ever happened in the world is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's take some time to take a look at Matthew's account of this resurrection. We've already read the verses, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. But let me read verse 1 and 2 again as we take a look at my first point, the stone. The stone. So, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And so notice right away, we can see here that there's a contrast in these first two verses. You have the contrast maybe of death and life. Uh, what did they do? The women who are alive are coming to see what? The sepulcher. A, a picture of death, right? Uh, the women, they are weak. They are powerless. In, in other accounts, it talks about how they came. They wanted to anoint the body, but they didn't even know how they were going to do it. Because who would roll the stone away for them? And we see that the weakness of the women is contrasted with the greatness of God. You've got hopeless, helpless people who are simply coming to see the sepulchre, who are coming for, if you will, one last shot at looking at the place where their Lord lay to reverence his memory. But instead they're met by a supernatural act of God. What a, what a contrast, what a, what a shock. And uh, when we think about it, you know, here recently, there's a, I don't know if you guys have ever uh, heard of this, there's a uh, Christian organization called the Babylon Bee. Have you guys ever seen that? It's like a satire, such hilarious stuff. They put out this uh, video here because it's, you know, getting, it's close to Easter. They put out this video about the 12 apostles, well, 11, sorry, 11 apostles meeting. And it's, uh, the theme is like, well, what if the apostles stole the body, right? If you remember from later on in Matthew, it talks about that's what the Jews said, that the, the, the apostles might have stole the body and hid the body away. And uh, Peter's like gathered all the guys up and he's like, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. So we're going to go down there, we're going to roll that stone away, and they're like, how are we going to do that? That thing's huge, there's so many people. He's like, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. We're going to roll that stone away, and we're going to steal the body. They're like, how in the world are we going to do that? There's tons of Roman soldiers. He's like, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. We're going to steal the body. And then we're going to hide the body, and we're going to tell everyone that he's alive. He's, and they're like, okay, and then, and then 
we all get brutally murdered! And they're like, yeah! And they're all like super excited, like, that's a great idea, this is awesome! And, uh, and again, the point is pointing out the absurdity of the apostles going and doing this, stealing the body, if that really is what happened. What reason in the world do they have to go and tell everybody, the world, go travel all over the world and tell everybody they met, look, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. What reason, what motivation could possibly possess them? And they took it to their grave. They sealed their testimony with their blood, right? And so instead, what did they do? Uh, or instead, what do we see? We see the women they came. We see the stone rolled away. We see that this idea that the disciples just stole the body is ridiculous. But they're going to the sepulcher in a way to simply honor their teaching. The women. So back to the women. The women who are going to the sepulchre, not really knowing what they're meaning. Now, let's contrast this with an event. Again, the disciples, they go, they tell everybody that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, what would happen, do you think, had it not really happened? Had, it, had they actually stolen the body and gotten away? What, what do you think would have happened? You know, they go, they, maybe they get a little bit of a cult following, eventually it fizzles out, right? That's what you got to think would really happen unless there's something more to it. Uh, you know, in uh, New York, there is a uh, sect of Orthodox Jews who believed that their rabbi was the Messiah. They're like, this guy is it. This guy's the Messiah, and he's the one who's going to uh, you know, lead the Jews back into being the premier nation of the world or whatever. And uh, this uh, Messiah of theirs grew old and died. So what did they do? They buried him. But they believed that he would raise from the dead. And so what do they do? They still, to this day, they go to his grave, and they adorn his grave with flowers, and they, they go and they honor his memory, and they wait for him to resurrect from the dead. Still hasn't happened. They're going to be waiting a very long time. I'm sorry to inform them. It's not going to happen. They missed their Messiah. Their Messiah was Jesus. Contrast that again with what happened here. You've got the stone rolled away. You've got the body missing. You've got the women saying that they've seen Jesus. They go, they tell the apostles. The apostles then see Jesus. And 500 people see Jesus. And they go and they tell everybody, like, look, he's here. This is it. This is him. He's the one. And compare that again to what happened in New York. There's nobody who believes that that guy's the Messiah. There's no evidence of it. But they saw the women. They go. They see a miracle. It's not just a trip to a shrine like in some other religions. And uh, one of the things that we may understand is that this account is not chronological. Also, we need to understand that that's okay. But who is this angel of the Lord? You know, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Who is this angel of the Lord? And well, it may just have been an angel, a powerful angel, some speculate Michael or Gabriel or something like that. They could have been. But other studies and studies that I have done in the past have led me to believe that this could be Christ himself. If you study the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, you'll see that many times they are what are referred to as theophanies, that is, appearings of Christ before his incarnation. And so if that is the case, notice that it is the angel of the Lord who descended from heaven and rolled the stone back from the door. This is symbolic in a sense, or, or literal, I guess you could say it's a literal, in showing that the angel of the Lord has the power to roll back the stone, has the power to resurrect from the dead. Jesus had the power to resurrect from the dead. He could do it. Of course, he said that in John chapter 10, verse 18. John chapter 10, verse 18 says, uh, well, John, chapter 8. John chapter 10, verse 18 says, uh, No man taketh it, speaking of his life, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And we see, see that Jesus had the power to resurrect, that his Father had given it to him. Now, also, God the Father is credited with, uh, with resurrecting Jesus in Romans 6, 4. It talks about that. And then later on in Romans, Romans 8, 11, the Holy Spirit is credited. So what do we see? We see all three persons of the Trinity as credited as being the ones who raised Jesus from the dead. So, 
That may be a little confusing. You may be asking yourself, okay, well, who did it then? Who raised Jesus from the dead? And the answer is, God did. God raised Jesus from the dead. Is this angel of the Lord in chapter Matthew chapter 28? Is it Jesus? It, I, it doesn't have to be. It just says angel of the Lord. So it's, we know it's the angel of the Lord, right? That's what we know for sure. It doesn't have to be Jesus. But it seems to line up with the idea that Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, all three of them have the power to resurrect because they're God. One God, three persons. And that is a great thing to think about. And notice that he then sits upon the stone. So he came and he rolled back the stone. So this angel of the Lord has great power given to him by God. Power that only God should uh, has, ultimately. And he sits upon the stone, a testament to how easy this whole thing was, right? Um, that talks about that in uh, Hebrews, is it, where it talks about how Jesus, after he finished everything, he went and he sat down. If you remember the high priest, when the high priest did his duties, there was no chair. There was nowhere for the high priest to sit. But Jesus being our great high priest, he sat down symbolizing the end of his work. It is finished, he said, on the cross as he died. The sacrifice was done. The atonement was made. Everything that was necessary to secure your salvation, to secure my salvation, to secure the salvation of the whole world, it was done. So all those who believe in Jesus know assuredly that the work is finished. He sat down. It's over. We, by faith, can enter into the Holy of Holies boldly coming before God the Father as children because of what Jesus did, not because of anything we do. We simply come by faith. And we see that he sits upon it, showing the ease of the event, showing that it's done, it's over, it's taken care of. The stone of sin, if you will, in our lives has been rolled away. The burden of sin rolled away. The fear of death removed. And we now have nothing separating us. Us and God, we have our mediator, Jesus Christ. So that's an interesting thought. That's something to maybe study more on yourself. And that leads me to point number two, the shaking. The shaking. So verses 3 and 4 say, Matthew 28, 3 and 4 says, His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. Now if you remember Jesus, when he appears in Revelation, what is he wearing? He's wearing white garments, he's got glowing, bell glowing feet, stuff like that. So uh, again, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be Jesus, but it's just... It's interesting again. And verse 4, And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became his dead man. What happened to John when he saw the thing? He died. He fell over like he was a dead man. Okay, so interesting. But I'm just saying, it's just interesting. I'm not, not going to be dogmatic on anything here. Again, we know this is the angel of the Lord. We know that when men see the angel of the Lord, they're scared to fall down like dead. And so the appearance of the angel of the Lord to the keepers was terrifying. Right? It was a terrible, it was an absolute... And and for every person who's lost, who has not accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, every one of those, every person will one day stand before God, and it will be a terrifying experience. It will be thunders and lightning and judgment and fury and terror and darkness and fear and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And these keepers experience just a slight little amount of that right here as the angel of the Lord appears. But to his followers, again, notice the contrast. I love how Matthew is painting such great contrasts in these verses. He's contrasting, contrasting, contrast. To his followers, it's joy, it's peace, it's relief. It's, it's the most amazing thing that's ever happened in the world. Such a dramatic contrast. And this same thing bears true with believers and unbelievers today. If we look at 2 Corinthians Chapter 2, Paul spoke of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'll flip there really quickly, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Oh, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Says, And also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I was minded to come, okay, this must be the wrong chapter. It's got to be 1 Corinthians chapter. Chapter 2, verse 14. Sorry. That is not the right verse. This is the verse of the verse I'm looking for is the one the savor of life unto life, savor of death unto death for those that don't believe. Uh, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are full of. Oh, no. Okay, so I've got the wrong. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong. 216. 216. Very good. 2 Corinthians 2 16. Okay, well, in any event, this uh, passage it talks about how. 
those that believe. Okay, I was reading. I was reading chapter one. Forgive me. So to the one verse, Second uh, Corinthians chapter fourteen through sixteen, and this is chapter two this time. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. So notice we triumph in Christ, as opposed to these keepers they fell down like dead in fear, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. So it's our job to take the knowledge of God to everyone. We are the savor of life to those that believe and listen. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, because we're in Christ, we follow Christ, and them that are saved, and in them that perish, so now contrasting the same from those that do not believe, the unsaved, to the one we are the savor of death and the death, that is the perish, sorry, perish, to the other the savor of life and the life. So those are the saved, those that believe. And who is sufficient for these things? So how are we going to do all this? How are we going to accomplish our task? And so that's the question that is asked, of course, by the power of God. So we see, here's my point. Saved people in the presence of God hearing about the things that God has done, hearing about the judgment of God and the wrath that's to come, we're not scared of that. We're not worried about that. We see God as our Father, as someone who we, who we can come to, who we can lay our cares upon, who we can ask for help from. Like, my children ask me for, for food and water and things like that, right? Because he's, he's our provider. But to the unsaved, it's like death. They, just, they, can't, they can't bear God. They can't stand God. How many atheists have you heard just cursing God and cursing him. What did God ever do to that? Like, what, I mean, what, what, how, how can it be that bad, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But it is. It's like death unto death. They're just, they're disgusted by it. They can't, they can't deal with it. And so that is still true even to this day. Those that believe in God and follow God, they are, um, they, they love God. It's, it's joy to be around. God is sweet to the faithful, but he's unbearable to the faithless. Just unbearable. So which group do you identify with here? Are you with the women? Or are you with the watchers? Is your day coming? Are you still struck by the thought of God? Are you struck with fear, with terror? Is it like a dart that goes through your heart every time you think about that day of judgment that's coming? Or are you with the women and you know that that day of judgment is not a day where you will be judged for your sins, but it is a day where you will be judged by your deeds and things that you have done for God and you will be rewarded and you expect to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the rest, the rest of your Lord, or forgive me if I butchered that verse. So, is this a miracle, or just some nonsense spread by cultists? You know, we already talked about that, about the apostles. So we see here that both people, both groups, experienced the miracle. The keepers experienced it, and the women experienced it. The women accepted it for what it was. They saw the truth in it. They saw that it was Jesus Christ rising from the dead. And by faith, they trusted in him. And they go on to follow him and go on to serve him. But the keepers, whether they did or not, it's not clear from the text. But we assume that the way that the story is painted here, that we've got a group that denies him. Though they saw the miracle. Same with the, when, if you think about the priests and the elders and the rulers. They knew that it happened. Just like the apostles knew that it happened. Just like everyone in the city knew that it happened. But they wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't believe it. They just, they could not bring themselves to do that. And so, which group do you identify with? Do you identify with the group that believes in miracles? Or do you identify the group that, even when they saw a miracle, denied it? Even when they saw a miracle, they denied it. You know, there's this famous debate, I don't know if you, if you uh, guys like, I, I like apologetics, I study apologetics a lot. And so I will. I, I watched a bunch of videos and read a bunch of books from Christian apologists. And one that's rather in the foremost, foremost, I don't agree with everything that he says or does, is uh, William Lane Craig. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But uh, he once had a debate with an atheist. And this atheist went on to use this argument, basically, that the apostles did not see a miracle. Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. They were all just hallucinating. This was one mass group hallucination. And uh, he, he went on to point that over and over and to hammer that point. Look, they're just hallucinating. This didn't really happen. They're all crazy. And it's just some crazy cult that sprang out from that. And that's what Christianity is today. Uh, now, William Lane Craig got a chance to question him after this. And he asked the atheist, what would it take for you 
to believe that God exists. And the atheist is like, okay, well, if I were to believe that God exists, and I wake up in the morning, and I go outside, and, and a 30-foot tall man is standing there, and he says unto me, you, you right there, I'm God, and you must believe in me, and, and, and uh, something like that. He's like, okay, well, then I would accept that God exists, to which William Lane Craig replies, oh, that's interesting. I would think that you're hallucinating. And so what we see here is we see a miracle. And the, the issue is not, did a miracle happen? A miracle happened. The issue is, do you believe it? Do you believe that this miracle happened? Do you believe that not only did this miracle happen, but does it save your soul? And so that brings me to point number three, the seeking. The seeking. So verses five and six then, to finish up this uh, section, it says, oh, I gotta go back. Back in uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 and 6 says, And the angel answered and said unto the women. So notice the angel speaks to the women. He does not speak to the keepers. Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord led. Now, some may point to this verse. And you can say, see, look, this isn't Jesus because he says, look, you're looking for Jesus. Let me show you he's not here. And uh, let me show you where it, where it lays. So, okay, maybe it is just an angel in that regard. But don't forget that in other accounts, uh, they didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. They thought he was the gardener. He was there. And, uh, and, and Jesus has a history of kind of hiding himself, talking about himself. Uh, remember the guys on the road to Emmaus and Luke? He talks about everything about himself and stuff. So, so whatever, I mean, it's okay. It's, it's, not, it's not groundbreaking. The point is that Jesus did resurrect and that Jesus was not there. His body was not there. The body was gone. But the thing, again, that is different between the women and the keepers, for example, to keep it with two groups that were contrasting, is the seeking. Notice that the women came seeking. Now, what were they seeking? I, I just, this really struck me as I'm uh, going through, uh, as I'm preaching this, they came to see the sepulchre. They, came, they didn't come to see a miracle. They didn't even come to see, I guess they came to see Jesus because they expected Jesus to be in the sepulchre. But they came to see the sepulchre. They came to see the body of Jesus. But they're still seeking Jesus. The keepers weren't seeking Jesus. They were there because of duty, because of work or whatever. And so this is what separates the wheat from the chaff. Those that are seeking those that are looking for something more. Uh, but what about Romans 3.11? One may interject, you know, there is none that seeketh after God, as that says. There is none righteous, no, no, there is none that understands. There is none that seeketh after God. Well, we see that God draws men through the power of a story. So the women who allegedly are not seeking God because no man can seek God, we're still seeking Jesus. How is this possible? Well, God resolves this through the power of of the Word of God. I've, I've talked about this a lot before, about the Word of God and how important it is. And so this is the thing we need to understand. By nature, man will never seek God. By nature, man is a rebel. By nature, man wants nothing to do with God. But God has sent His Word throughout the world, and when man, who is a rebel, hears this Word, God works in the hearts of men, in the hearts that are dead, by the way. The Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. And through supernatural power, works a miracle in the hearts of men, akin to the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in which men who by nature hate God, want nothing to do with God, love sin, want to continue in sin, and want to just... Uh, not that they will be as evil as they possibly can be, but, the, but they'll uh, be as evil as they can get away with, will change their mind, will repent, and follow God and believe in God, and then God is able to shape those people and, and turn them into the godliest of saints. It's, it's mind-blowing. It is a miracle, just like the miracle of Jesus Christ resurrecting. And so we see that God uses the power of His Word. You can understand it as the power of a story. Everyone likes a good story, right? We like to hear a good story. You know, man and girl, they fall in love. Something happens. It separates them. He overcomes. They reunite. They live happily ever after. Right? Everyone loves a story, right? That's a great story. But this story, 
the story of Christ, the story of the resurrection, this is the greatest story ever told. Think about it. You've got a young man of no importance, born in the backwater area, in some area on the corner of the Roman Empire. Nobody knows where it is. Nobody cares. He has no money. He's poor. But he grows up. People can see there's something special about him. But he doesn't let people know until he's about 30. And when he's 30, then he goes out and he begins his public ministry and he performs all these miracles. People are so excited because they've been waiting for the Messiah and they think this could be him. And he goes around and he begins to tell people, yes, I am the Messiah. I'm the one that's coming. And then to his select little group of followers, he tells them, well, look, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be buried and I'm going to raise him on the third day. And they don't know what's going on. They don't understand. And then sure enough, it happens. He's betrayed by one of his inner circle, by one of his good friends, one of the twelve. And then he's crucified, and it looks like everything is over. Like the whole thing was, was all for naught, and how could that be? But then he rises from the dead, raises from the dead, right? And then his disciples go on to tell the message all around the world, and here we are, 2,000 years later, still telling the same story, and you just can't beat it. You just can't beat this story. It's just such a great story. And so... The crucifixion, that story of the crucifixion, in a sense, brought the ladies to Jesus. God is using the Word of God to affect us and move us in a way that maybe we don't even realize or understand at the time. But then we, uh, the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But how is the faith confirmed? How is the faith confirmed? You know, you can have faith in a lot of things, right? Uh, have you ever heard of this? There's this fake religion, and it's called uh, Pastafarians. Have you ever heard of this? Okay, yeah, you've heard of this? They've got this uh, thing, and what this is, is a group of atheists who decided to mock Christianity, because that's in vogue in, in America or in Europe or wherever they're from. And uh, what they did is they said that they believe in the flying spaghetti monster. And of course, the spaghetti monster is invisible and all-powerful and stuff like that. And one of the ways that they show their allegiance to the flying spaghetti monster is they take a colander, a spaghetti colander, and they'll wear it on their head. That's their religious motif. As a matter of fact, one of their members tried to get his uh, driver's license picture while wearing a spaghetti colander, and they were like, get out of here, buddy. And he, I guess he sued him and took him to court. They finally let him have the stupid picture because he said it was their, his religion or something. Uh, so, so this is foolishness, right? So that sort of faith is dumb. Everyone sees it. They even know it. They know it's a joke. Because it's a blind faith. It's a faith that has no evidence. There's no foundation for this. But our faith is not a blind faith. It is not a faith that is simply rooted in, well, so-and-so told so-and-so, who said so-and-so said this or that. No, we don't have that. We have the primary sources from the apostles, eyewitness account of what happened. And we have a miracle that only God could perform to confirm that it truly is God who is, if you will, behind this book, behind our belief, behind our faith. Again, take you back to something that I mentioned earlier. What miracle did Muhammad perform? I'm not ragging on Muslims or anything like that. I'm not getting on anybody. What miracle did he perform? What did he show from God to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he truly was the last messenger, or whatever they say, of that time? What did he do? Jesus did a lot of miracles, <laughs> a lot, and he did a really good one at the end, right? He did a lot. And so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and then God confirms his word through his miracles. Think about it. Why is there so many false signs and false miracles throughout the day? And I don't want to pick on, uh, again, another group of people. But there's been uh, there are set, there are sects of Christianity that uh, the uh, that that's all they care about, right? They just want an experience. They want miracles. They want all of this stuff, and that's what they're so focused on on, on doing this to the point where there are even people who uh, they fake this stuff and they've been caught faking this stuff, and it's just working up all of this emotional sort of stuff. What? But why is it that Satan is always trying to do miracles? Because he understands that only God can do miracles. And if he can trick you and get you into thinking that, oh man, this is a miracle, then Satan can get you off the path from Christ. So you've got to be careful. So we don't just accept any miracle. We don't just accept anything. Are there things that are miraculous that are done that are not of God? I think so. I think there are powers and 
principalities and powers and things in this world that we need to be careful of. So we need to have discernment. But on this thing, on this issue, this is clear. Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and he is, uh, and that is a miracle that has been stamped with God's approval, and he has shown it over and over again. So don't go chasing any miracle. Don't go believing every miracle. Because Satan is always trying to work miracles. He's deceiving and illusionist. He's able to change himself into an angel of light. And Satan has his own ministers that go out and try to lead people astray. And he does, and they do. And they do it through miracles, what are perceived as miracles. But what then makes the story of the resurrection so powerful and so special? What is it about it that's so special? I mean, think about your life. I mean, I think most of us here are Christians, right? Do you remember the first time you heard the gospel? I, I don't, honestly. I heard the gospel a lot I'm growing up. You know, I grew up and I went to church. We kind of went on and off and, and stuff like that. And I don't remember the first time, but I remember that one time I heard it. You know what I'm saying? I remember that one time I heard it. When the gospel hit me like a ton of bricks, and I knew I'm like, oh man, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. If I die right now, I would go to hell, and I deserve it. And I knew that Jesus Christ was the only way. He was my only hope. He was my only Savior. He was the only thing. And it was because he had risen from the dead that I had any hope, that I had any reason to even call on him. You can't be saved by a dead Savior. A dead Savior doesn't do anybody any good. Jesus is alive. He's alive. And that, and that just knowing that I was able to call upon Christ. And right there, that's what makes the resurrection so powerful. And so special, so that here we are, 2,000 years later, still telling the same old, old story, still telling people who've never heard it before the same old, old story. And people all throughout the world are hearing the gospel, some for the first time, some for the tenth time, some for the hundredth time, and they're believing it because it has power. It's the power of God that is behind it. So what makes the Christian religion so special and so powerful? And the answer, of course, is the resurrection. There is no other religion in the world that I'm aware of, or major religion, how about major religion? There's no other major religion that I've studied, that I know of, that has anything even close to a resurrection. It has anything even close to God who loves us. First of all, that's a novel concept. We, we, we take these things for granted. I remember hearing a story of a missionary who went into the deep jungles of Africa, and um, he's reading the Bible to them, right? And so you can imagine he's met inside of this uh, tribal hut, and the tribe is gathered around, there's hundreds of uh, these uh, uh, bushmen, whatever they call them, something like that. The missionary is reading the Bible, and he begins to read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, and moves on to 17, 17. And the chief then stops him. Wait, 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 wait. What did you say there? Go back. And so he goes back, and he reads John 3, 3 16 again. And the chief is like, wait, read it again. And he goes back and reads it again. At this point, the missionary looks up and he realizes everybody's crying. He's like, what's going on? Why are you all crying? And the chieftain says to him, didn't you hear? God loves us. God loves us. He's like, our gods, they, they, they don't love us. They never loved us. None of the gods ever. But your God they loves us. And so that's something that's so special and so powerful is understanding that God loves us so much he gave his only begotten son and then he resurrected him from the dead to prove uh, to us that we are, uh, that we can trust him, that this truly is the way of salvation, that we have access to God by faith in Christ, uh, and that that's the only way. So consider my case. I don't know if I've convinced you. I hope you're convinced that Christianity is a special religion, at least to that degree. And it's special because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, it is a, uh, an event that happened in history. It really happened. It's attested to by many uh, uh, witnesses. The historical evidence for Jesus Christ is stronger than the historical evidence of most other world figures in ancient times. We know more about the death of Jesus Christ than any other ancient figure uh, in, the, in the ancient world. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there are more books written on the Bible and things like that. But in any of the other major religions, what miracle is necessary to believe in order to be a member of that religion? And let's compare and contrast just a little bit, just really quickly, as we come to a close. 
What does Islam require? Does it require belief in a risen Messiah? Absolutely not. They deny that Christ even died on the cross or that Christ what, uh, is the uh, Messiah. Islam requires submission. Okay? You have to submit yourself to God. Now, what miracle, again, is performed to prove to you that submitting to God, Allah, as they call him, is the proper one? That that is the proper religion? There's nothing. There is nothing. They'll say the Quran. The Quran is a miracle. Like, come on. <laughs> come on. Compare that with the resurrection. Come on. Um, now, Buddhism requires merit, right? So uh, this time now, we're coming up on Songkran, right? And Songkran, you've got a, uh, my, our teacher, one of my Thai teachers in class was telling me uh, that some of the things that they'll do for Songkran is you can go down to the Wat and you can buy uh, fish from there and you take them over to the river and then you release them in the river and you get there. Or what you can do, and I've seen these two uh, down in the uh, city, there are people and they will sell birds. And what they've done is they've taken birds and they put them in a cage. And what you do, you buy these birds from these people and you release the bird and the bird flies off and you get merit. And the first question, and I haven't pressed anybody on this because I don't, uh, I'm not, you know, I don't want to argue with people or, or anything like that, especially when we're just, I'm there to learn time. Uh, but the, the, the first question that comes up to me on this issue of merit is, who's keeping track of it? Who's counting? Like, when they talk about merit. Well, you need to earn merit. You need to do this. And it's like, why does releasing a bird give you merit anyway? What, what does that have to do with anything? So you've got some person, and they go and they catch the bird, and they stuff it in a cage, and then they sell it to you so that you can release release the bird, and that gives you merit? Shouldn't that like be negative merit because you've just paid to let, have this person go capture a bird and stuff it in a cage, and they're like abusing wildlife? You know, same with these fish, like these fish, you let them out. What do they do? They go and they catch them, they put them back in their thing, and then they keep them there to sell to you. Like, is, is that really meritorious <laughs> if you really think about it? You know, who's keeping track of this stuff? Uh, or, you know, I mean, some people will say, well, merit isn't really part of the Buddhism. That's just kind of beliefs and things. And really what you need to do is you need to relinquish all of your desires through enlightenment. And that's what Buddha taught that to not desire anything is the most ultimate thing that, uh, that we need to achieve to. But wait a second. Don't I have to desire to not have any desires? So how do I, how do, how do I relinquish my desires if I desire to relinquish my desires? I'm not getting this one. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just not working for me. Now compare that again with Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, who was buried, who rose again the third day, who loves you, who gave himself for you, who sits at the right hand of the throne of heaven. They say that Buddha ascended into heaven, that he became an enlightenment and stuff like that. And okay, they say that, but what miracle proves it? What miracle proves it? And then, of course, other major religions, Hinduism requires works. You have to have works of faith. And you can take Judaism. You know, Judaism, they, of course, do not believe in Christ, but they think that as long as you're a good person, you're going to go to heaven. That's all that matters. You just need to be good. Just be a good person. But there's no miracle. There's no belief even required. It's just all about acts. You just do the right thing and stuff. And I'm not against doing the right thing. I think that's a great thing, too. But a miracle which the Bible and the apostles claim happened in our world, for real, really in our world, in a time that really happened. This is not mythology. This is not once upon a time. This is not a galaxy long, far, far away. This is in our world. It really happened. They attested to it. These are real people who really lived, who really wrote these books and gave them to us. And they claim that this really happened. They saw Jesus die. They saw him buried. They saw him alive. He spent time with them. They touched him. He ate with them. He was not a ghost. He was not a spirit. And they sealed that testimony with their own blood. So what do you think? Which religion is the best? Is that even right to say? Is it even, is it even right to not say that? And which way will actually and miraculously save your soul. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And uh, I've said that for a long time. By the grace of God, I've said that for a long time. I've gotten a lot of trouble for saying that. Uh, but um, um, it's true. It's true. And God proves it. He proves it by the miracle. So let's, uh, um, let's pray, and then we will be dismissed. Dear Father, I thank you so much.